Oh, hey, didn't see you there. I was just, uh, yeah, just, just finishing my workout and I, uh, you know, thought I'd make a video, uh, you know, talking about saviors and demons because, like, that's what we do here, stuff, whatever. Anyway, what's up, guys? Welcome to. <laughs> So sorry, I had to open with a, with a dumb bit. I had to do it. I was vibing it. Um, what's up, guys? I am Raja. Welcome to Full Blast. And today's video comes from um, something that I saw in the Facebook group. Uh, there was a, a really interesting dis discussion going um, about the uh, the whole Savior Demon thing. And, you know, are our problems in life due to, you know, uh, savior addiction, right? Because that does seem to be one of the big premises of objective personality, how they they've sort of at least loosely define their terms in, you know, what they're looking for, what they've been able to observe at scale. Um, and a lot of what they stumbled upon is like, man, their big problems in life are generally rooted in savior addiction. Um, and I think that that's, at scale, probably pretty true. Here, So I, I want to start the video by defining what I see at scale really meaning. Um, because I think that, that that is just as important as all of these other terms that we talk about, we say, define your terms, define your terms. What, what do we mean when we say at scale? So it's really, really easy to think that, and again, this is not, I'm not blowing anybody's mind here, I hope. Um, it's very easy to think that your bubble is representative of the, of the whole world, right? We have all seen this, we've all done whatever, whatever. Here's what I did not realize until fairly recently. And I think that this is true probably across the board. Um, but again, I, I have no I have no way of knowing. One of the big traps that I fell into uh, and still fall into in a lot of cases is thinking my bubble is bigger than it actually is. And sort of surrounding yourself with so much media, whatever, whatever, that you, it's not even like the, that I'm, it's not that I'm unaware that other bubbles exist, right? It's not that it's like, well, everybody thinks this way. You don't agree with me? Oh boy, I didn't know. No, it's obviously not that. I'm not stupid. But I think that it's very easy to, lull yourself into this sense of like, look, we are, you know, people who think like me and look like me, whatever, whatever, are like 55% of the country. And that's not true at all. Like, my cohort is very, very, very small. Like, when you really, really get down to it, like, Look, I happen to be a person of color, but I was adopted. So, like, my parents are white. All of my family is white. All of my family friends are white. Like, I am, for all intents and purposes, culturally super, super white bread suburban American. Uh, and then layer on top of that, like, college educated. Went to college right out of high school. Went to a four-year college lean, you know, liberal, uh, have multiple friends with PhD. Like it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so I think that it's important that when, when we think about these concepts of like, where all of our, like when we're really making these big generalizations, uh, I think it is important to assume that your bubble is smaller than you think it is. Because I think it's really easy to, to recognize when you're in a bubble. I think it's a lot harder to understand the size of that bubble relative to other bubbles, right? So that is something, and again, I say this as somebody who, until very recently, labored under the aggressive delusion uh, that my bubble was enormous. Still a bubble, 
But like, nah, bro, my cohort's real tiny. We happen to be loud in certain areas of Twitter, but like, it's real tiny, y'all. So I bring that up because, you know, we're talking about, uh, I'm gonna actually, I found the, the actual whole ass question. Do you think all problems in life are fundamentally rooted in an over addiction to your saviors? Um, and most people said no. Um, I think that that is broadly pretty correct. Uh, some people said yes. I don't think that is entirely incorrect either. Uh, one person said depends on childhood. But here's what I said. Uh, it depends entirely on how early in life your saviors failed you. Uh, so like that I think is an thing that we haven't really seen a lot of. And I'm gonna bring up, uh, up a couple of people in the community, um, a couple of the discussions you know, that were on the Facebook group. This is from a while ago. So there are a lot of people of my very similar type uh, in the OP community in the personality community in general, uh, maybe not in general, but certainly the OP community has just a glut of like lead NT blasters who are also IJs, right? Like, again, some of us are cranked up. Uh, I, I, think the, I think I am the most cranked up of the IJ blastery people, uh, just because I do have that masculine sensory at the bottom, so that gives me that little extra punch. Uh, but there are so fucking many of the double feminine uh, INTJ blast play consume sleep last. Like it's fucking wild. And we are all so different. Oh my God. Like there's a, there's, there's a, a very prominent member of the community, uh, Austin Olar. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. Austin, please tell me in the comments below how to pronounce your last name because I actually don't know. Um, but like Joshua McCray, like there are, there are a number of people who I have spoken to, uh, plenty of conversations with, had interviews with, and our vibe is just so different. It's so, so different. Now, part of that, absolutely, 100%, is my masculine sensory. No question. We were doing the, um, there's a couple of those uh, INTJ videos floating around there where it's just like the quick hits of like, here's what a bunch of INTJ said about this thing. And it's like 45 second answers. And one of the things that they mentioned there is they're like, man, as soon as you said to, as soon as we told you to give a 45 second answer, all of your answers were between 45 and 50 seconds. Like how the, how did you do that? And I'm like, because time has weight, y'all. Like the masculine sensory physically tracks shit on a timeline. Things have weight. And again, it's part of why I started this video uh, in Douche Town, uh, you know, doing the, doing the bicep curls. Because part of why, you know, like, again, how about, how about just like, lead, like INTJ, right? Let's just say the INTJ general archetype, right? So you're, we're talking the uh, the double feminine, right? People like Austin, uh, people who are a little bit more balanced, uh, someone like Lindsay Johnson, uh, our good buddy Lee Joe out there. You should go check out her channel. She's fantastic. Um, you got people like me who are super cranked up. Uh, I'm also even lumping in, you know, someone like Dave, uh, cause he is an INTJ, he's sleep blast play. So he's got the consume at the bottom, but he's still pretty INTJ. So you would think that even with like the sexual modalities and the whatever, like the fact that we all have savior NT blast and are INTJs, that should mean that our life problems are fairly similar, but they're not. And our life trajectories are not that similar either. And I think that, you know, there, look, there absolutely is the conversation about privilege and, um, you know, uh, economic advantages versus educational advantages. Like that shit adds up. Absolutely. I think that that's a little too multifaceted for what I feel comfortable feeling qualified to talk about. 
Um, but know that that is like very, very much a part of this whole, whole schmear as well, right? But I think that at, at the core of that, it really comes down to when did your savior functions first start to fail you? And I think about somebody like Dave, right? So Dave is somebody who I would consider, again, I don't know if this is actually true. Um, I would say that he got his ass kicked a little bit later in life than I was expecting. And I really, I'd be like, but he was 32. That's so young. Yeah, but with like the pace of the internet and like just the way the world works now, like I see, and again, Dave is seeing this as well. Like people are getting their ass kicked really like in their early 20s, which is great in a lot of ways. It's tough uh, just to get your ass kicked, period. But I like, I think that overall, like it definitely does build character to get your ass kicked earlier and force you to use other muscles. And I think that one of the big reasons that we are, why you can observe such a difference uh, is just the all of the random circumstances in life coming together, kicking our ass at different times. So as I have mentioned on, you know, on many an occasion on this channel, so I am an actor. Uh, I lived, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I went to school in Chicago for five years. I lived in New York for 10 years. And I recently moved to Los Angeles. And again, who fucking knows anything? Uh, planning more than three months out, even without the coronavirus, feels foolish. But like, I really like it out here. I feel calm. I feel settled. I feel thriving. I think it's a place where I can grow and do all the things I want to do, whatever, whatever. Um, but again, look, who, who knows I'm gonna, how long anyone's going to stay anywhere. Um, the world's changing really fast. Uh, but for right now, I'm here and I'm happy. Uh, living in New York in your 20s, like, that'll just kick your ass. It just will. There's no way around. I do not care how much money you have, how good your job is, how much privilege. Like, doesn't fucking matter. New York in your 20s will just fucking ream you. It just will. That's just how New York works. And I think about, in addition to that, so as, as I mentioned earlier, right? So I am an INTJ, savior N-I-N-T-E. I'm blast with ST play, then consume, then sleep. So I'm doubling up on my ST play. I did musical theater for 15 years, 10 of which, 10 of those years were like professionally in New York in callbacks for Broadway shows. You do not get more NF than theater folk. Like it just fucking doesn't happen. They are the most NF bunch. They're, they are on par in very many ways with like the, the Reiki healers and the like the metaphysical community has a lot of overlap with the theater community in terms of energy. And here I am save your NT ST doubling up on my ST trying to thrive in an NF heavy field with SFs. Like it's an NF SF field. Like, Holy shit. My saviors are going to fail me so fucking fast. Like it's not even close. Uh, I, I don't stand a chance uh, when it comes to like, trying to go all, I can't go all into my saviors. Going all in on my saviors is not going to get the job done. Whether it's, that's not going to get me what I want. That's not going to get me the SE gathering that I want to do. It's not going to fit into my plan. Again, you can put whatever fucking words you want on it. Going all in on my saviors is just not going to end well. And that becomes really, really apparent really, really quickly. No. That's not to say that there weren't parts of my savior energy that I leaned into really hard and had a lot of success with, particularly my high play and low sleep. Like, even, even though I never had that, like, ethereal NF quality of, like, 
you have the musical theater it factor. Like, I just never had that. Uh, I have it in TV and film, which is why I moved to Los Angeles and why I live in Hollywood now and not New York City. Be but like, as far as like being theater folk and connecting with people on that NF level, it's just never going to fucking happen. Uh, I'm not going to say never, but like probably not as long as I live. Uh, I think I probably will end up on Broadway someday doing something, but it will very much be on my own terms and will not be like, like I will definitely be very far removed from the rest of the cast in whatever capacity I ha you know, I am back in the theater community. But I bring all this up because for 10 years in New York City, I tried to fit in. I tried to be the NFSF dude uh, and ignore my ST. So it was like, I needed to lean into my play energy, but not the ST part of that play energy. It was very, very strange. Uh, um, but what it meant is that I couldn't ever really get addicted to ST. It was always like, ST will get me part of the way there, and then NF will get me the other part of the way there. Or NT will get me started, but then I have to really quickly incorporate my ST, you know, my, my demon, you know, masculine SE at the bottom, my SF consume, I gotta do some NF. The NT is great to get me going, but I can't stay there for too long. And I think that, that really helped me in the long run uh, in terms of my personal development, my social development, whatever, whatever. Um, but in the context of objective personality and of personal growth and where our biggest life problems come from, um, I think that in addition to being a glass lizard, I think that a big, big part of it is that my saviors just never got a chance. They just, they never got to dominate the field, right? I, it was never, you know, I think about like when I was playing basketball, like YMCA basketball when I was in like third grade or whatever, and there were 10 kids on the team. There was the A team and the B team. There were three quarters. Everybody gets to play, uh, you know, or, sorry, there were, there were three periods per half. Every kid gets to play a total of three periods, right? Sort of it was A, B, A, B, A, B, like, Everybody gets to play. And that's sort of how I felt with all of my functions. Like, yeah, A team is stronger, but B team had to be not shitty. Like, it, it was not, here's my starting, it was not like the pros where it's like, here's the, here's the starting lineup. Here's my sixth man, my double activated demon function in the middle like Dave has with his TE. Like that's sort of his sixth man, so to speak. Um and then there's the rest of the bench that like, obviously at the professional level, you're fine calling on them, but like, hmm, they're not as good. They're not as good. They're not the, they're not the hot shots. Uh, and that just wasn't my experience growing up. And I think that that's why even more than my glass lizardness, I actually attribute my roundedness to, to my environment. Um, but I bring all of this up because I want to, I want to sort of pivot into a different discussion because it's something I've been thinking about a lot is like the who am I discussion, the, the who is my tribe, where do I fit in? Because I've been thinking a lot lately about uh, masculine versus feminine energy. It's really been on my mind. Um, and one of the big things that I've started to really lean into is my own masculine energy. And in OP terms, we can say that those are my two demon functions, my demon masculine, I see at the bottom, whatever, whatever. But like, on just like a human level, recognizing that, oh shit, I actually do fundamentally, energetically bring a lot of masculine energy into the room with me. And I'm only doing myself and the people around me a disservice by pretending like I don't. And it's not just that I'm an ass about it or that I'm situationally inappropriate, but it's like, if I come in fully owning the amount of masculine energy that I want to have, do have, whatever, whatever, 
then like it becomes so much easier for the right people to be attracted to me, for the wrong people to be repelled by me, and for people who are in positions of either authority or collaboration to be able to go, okay, yes, I get it. I get you. I see it. Yes, I know what to do with all of this. And then after they like talk to me for five minutes, they're like, oh, he's got some shades to him. Okay, okay. Right, and then that becomes a, a different, more full, more beautiful conversation. But on just like a fundamental instinctual, this is who I am, you know, I've really been trying to lean into that. And it, it's been really, really interesting to do that because what I'm realizing is like, I am not uncool. And that was sort of, that was a, that was a realization I had. It, it had sort of been creeping in my mind, but it hit me last night that like on the spectrum of like cool versus not cool, I am at the very least dead in the middle, but like edging towards the cooler side a little bit. And in OP terms, I think that a lot of that is due to the fact that yes, my two savior functions are my NI and my TE. I can do the NT nerd thing a little bit. But NT blast versus NT consume is real different. Like even just having TE is so different from TI, which is sort of like what I think a lot of us think of when we think of, you know, uh, nerdiness, uncool, whatever, whatever. I promise there's a point to this. But like, that's just, that's never been me. Adding to that, my N, my, in, you know, my, my intuitive function, which again is sort of the hallmark of like the, the iconoclast, the nerd culture is very N dominated, N E dominated. Personally, I think it comes from uh, the combination of Star, Star Trek and Dungeons and Dragons. Right, those are both very ne heavy sorts of uh, cultures and groups, uh, and that was sort of like the, a big foundation of nerd culture. Same with Tolkien, and I just never had that. My double activated observer function is masculine se. Like I have a lot of bro in me, and it's been really interesting to sort of see how like my savior, I, I, I remember the day that my savior functions finally failed me. I remember the day. Um, Cause I started, I, I quit drinking in 2016. I started working on 2017 and I was kind of dicking around with the way it's like, I was working with a trainer, but I just like, I didn't, I, I hadn't made the mindset shift. I was like starting to get there, but not quite. And I was about to go off and do this musical that I didn't want to do. And I just, I wasn't in it. And I come back and I'm like, oh, I get it now. Right. I know, I know what work I need to do. Like I, I see the map. It, I, I can attach my identity to it. And it was on my birthday. It was on my uh, 31st birthday that the switch happened that I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah, I just got to do this. Because what happened was, is it was my birthday, as I just said. Uh, and my whole plan is I was going to go, um, I was going to do a, a, a spin class in the morning. Then I was going to get a massage. I was going to recover the next day. And then I was going to do an upper body day by myself and then meet with my trainer to do a lower body day. And I started to chart out my week, uh, around my masculine sensory needs, my masculine SE needs. And it was the first time that rather than having a plan and be like, hey, go gather this, go gather this thing for my plan, because there's a, a whole missing in this box. It was my SE wanted to do something. My demon SE at the bottom of my stack wanted to do something. And my NI was like, okay, if that's what you want, then we'll make it happen. And the power balance was shifted. And I was like, motherfucker, this is it. All right, I get it. I get it. This is this needs to be the priority in order for me to grow, and I think that a, that that happens to a lot of people. Uh, it seems to be happening earlier and earlier, um, just because of the speed with which the internet moves. But like for me, it happened 
sort of around 29, 30, 31. Uh, for Dave, it happened a little bit later. It sounds like he had his big moment, uh, like 32, 33, from what I gathered, it was like when he started to descend and then really started to pick back up at like when he was like 35, 36, he started to get it get it together a little bit. So again, it depends at different times for different people. I know people who got their ass kicked and had that moment when they were 17, uh, when they were 15, right? If they were, uh, I don't know, uh, I was just watching Queer Eye, so Bobby's story sticks in my mind. Also, this is like a very uh, butch Bobby look, so I'm like kind of rocking it because Bobby's my boy. I uh, love that guy. But he talks a lot about how, so he, he was adopted like me. Uh, his story was a little sadder than mine, quite a bit sadder. Uh, he was disowned by his parents when he was 15 years old, left, he had to move out um, because he was adopted to a very religious family who didn't tolerate homosexuality. So that motherfucker had to grow up real quick that whatever his, whatever savior functions he had, like he just, he, he had to be a fully fledged who man and use every resource at his disposal in order to just survive. And one of the big vibes that I got from him was that he, so I, I think he's, I think he and I are actually pretty close in type. Um, I don't know exactly what, but I could see a lot of his like struggles between tribe and self. They're not his biggest struggles in the world. Um, but he does seem, I see him as being a uh, tribe over self. And obviously, look, this could happen to anybody. I would never wish this to anybody to be in this position. But one thing that he talks about, um, you know, they do the, like periodically like talk about their coming out story. And he was like, I heard the word gay in church in such a negative way all the time. And I, every, like we went to church every day and every night I came home and I just prayed to to God to make me not gay is what he kept saying. And so like, let's say for sake of argument, I don't know if this is true, but let's say for sake of argument, he is savior DE, right? Savior tribe connection. And he does talk about that a lot, right? He talks about like finding your chosen family. He talks about how the Fab Five have become like, a professional and personal family of his and how like this show has really changed his life. And these are the people around whom his life has changed. But I can tell that he struggles with identity and that it's something that he really had to work at. And I think that had his environment not forced such trauma upon him, he probably would not have maybe had so much angst about it. Uh, you know, if he, let's say he did grow up uh, in a household that would have been more accommodating and more loving, right? Let's say that were true. You know, maybe he maybe he would have been able to live in this savior DE land for longer and not have to worry. He's like, oh yeah, I guess I'm gay. Anyway, these are my friends, right? Like that, that leap would not have been as, as hard for him. Um, but, you know, because of that, he had to he had to get right with his di like his identity he's like yeah yeah no i i am gay that's just the reality huh right so that's sort of what i i bring all of these things up because in in very disparate ways a big part of just life man is recognizing when you're getting your ass kicked. And that's something that I, you know, have lightly been thinking about throughout just the, the whole quarantine shutdown time is like one of a, a big mark of maturity for me is when someone has the ability to recognize in the moment, oh, I'm getting my ass kicked right now. What I'm doing isn't working. So I need to change something in order to get what I want, in order to make this other person happy, in order to get the job, whatever it may be. Uh, and I think about you know the, the people in my life uh, who are you know in, friends of friends, whatever, people you see at game night, uh, who are not as mature, who are not as old. 
And you can see them going all in on their saviors just because life hasn't kicked their ass yet. Just, it, it, it hasn't happened, right? They haven't needed to change tack. They haven't needed to have that in the moment presence and awareness and self-reflection and all humility and the communion and the right connection, all of those things that have nothing to do with OP. The real, a real hallmark of maturity for me is when somebody, you know, I, I say this a lot and this is, it's, it's one of the big rules of improv. And I, I wish I had heard it sooner because it's so applicable to all of life. The biggest rule of improv. Yes, it is. Yes. And yes, it is. Yes. And, uh, and in some ways, it is also very much like if this is true, then what else is true? Like those are those are those are indeed fundamentals of like doing improv. But I think that the biggest rule of improv that I wish was stressed more at like the 101 level is the idea that once you say something, you don't get to you don't get to talk again until the other person responds. Unless you can tell that the other person is completely lost, that the wheels aren't turning, they're not doing anything, they, they, they missed what you said, you didn't give them enough, so you got to give them one extra line, right? So if, I, if we're having a conversation, uh, you know, and, and I start a scene, um, we're doing, let's say we're doing an interview scene, uh, and I say, yes, uh, uh, yes, Ms. Ms. Johansson, please come in, come in. That's my opening move. Like, that's what I have said. I said a thing. And now I don't get to say anything else because now she has to say something. And then she doesn't get to say anything else until I respond to it. And when you're doing that, now you're using all four functions. I don't care what those functions are. I don't care what your sensory is. I don't care what your saviors or demons are. When you are in the moment and you are present and you are communicating and you are listening and you are taking energy and you are giving energy, when you're doing all that, now we're talking. Now we're talking about like, you can't rely on your saviors, right? And I sort of think of it as, you know, and I'll, I'll end with this. You can sort of think of it really broadly, anecdotally, this is not applicable to everybody but I'd say maybe 55%, right? It's sort of the idea of, are you a talker or are you a listener? I, shocker of all shockers, prefer to talk more than I listen. Over time, I have discovered that just talking a bunch is not the right move. And even in just the act of talking and listening, right? You are doing, you know, let's say that talking is blast play. I know it's not really, but play along. And let's say that listening is consume sleep. I know not really, let's play along. You are now by default hitting all of your saviors and all of your demons. If you make an effort to both talk and listen in equal measure. And for bonus points, if you want to actually strengthen whatever the thing is that you know isn't as strong, aim for 60-40. But at the very least, go for 50-50. And I think that that's you know, a, sort of a, a good rule of thumb. Like if you are in a position where you're like, I, I feel myself doing the same thing over and over and over again, and I don't know what that thing is, but I can feel it. I can feel myself in a rut, I'm going not in the direction that I want to go. I can tell that things are not working, right? Pump, pump the brakes a little bit. Things are not working. First off, hella fucking Luya, self-awareness. Fucking nailed it. Awesome. And then from there, then you can go, okay, I am aware that I'm, that I don't love the way things are going. Okay, so what do I do about it? Well, I don't know what my functions are. I don't know what my saviors are or what my demons are. I don't know what I'm addicted to. Uh, it's just real tough. Okay, but here's what I can do. I can make an effort to talk and listen in equal measure. Because by doing that, by making an effort 
to talk and listen in equal measure. And a lot of times, you know, I had a, I had a beautiful conversation about a week ago, and I mentioned this uh, in one of my own personal videos. Uh, it was an amazing conversation. It was a long conversation, hard conversation, but a really good, emotional, introspective, productive conversation. And we were both like full tilt saviors and demons. Like we were doing the thing back and forth and it was incredible. But that wouldn't have happened if, if all of us, if both of us had been concerned with, well, I got to keep talking. I got, I, I got to, I got to fill the conversation, you know, or if one of us had been like, I'm just going to listen. I'm going to let him get it all out of his system. And then I'm going to talk. No, we had to like, I say a thing, pregnant pause. They say a thing, pregnant pause. Like talking, listening, talking, listening, talking, listening. When you do that, you cannot be all in on your saviors. It is actually impossible if you are talking and listening in equal measure to be all in on your saviors. So that's, that's what I sort of want to end on is like, if... If it is true that our biggest problems in life are indeed caused by an overindulgence and an overaddiction into our saviors, trust that the solution is not as complicated as I think some people, myself included, maybe make it seem. That there really is that level zero of, you know, I've been listening a lot. Maybe I need to start talking more. Or you know, maybe I just need to shut the fuck up once in a while and let other people do the talking and actually take in some of what they're saying, right? By doing either of those, now you're on your way to actually making progress, actually fixing the things in your life that you know need to be fixed and that you want fixed and that are ultimately going to make you into the most full, well-rounded, capable, competent, badass person that you can be. All right. That's all I got for today. Thank you for hanging out with me. Uh, have a lovely weekend, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye. Where's the end stream? And oh my God, where did the point chaos? <laughs>